Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our, uh, our collaborative workshop. Uh, I just want to do, we're just going to do some quick introductions and, uh, and then I'll explain a little bit about how this is going to, going to work and, and we'll, we'll dive right in. Uh, just, uh, just to start, my name is Frozen Walla. I'm an assistant professor of teaching in the Department of History and chair of the Middle East Studies program here at UBC. Um, and we're going to be talking about one of the uh, one of our uh, courses in the Middle East Studies program that we're working on today. Um, but before we get any further into that, maybe I'll I'll turn it over to uh, to my uh, team members here. Uh, Sophie, do you want to go next? Hi, uh, my name is Sophie Roth, and I graduated from UBC this past spring with a major in international relations and a minor in Middle East studies. Um, while I was a student, I was involved in the kind of tail end of the initial push um, of student organization for the creation of the minor program and the corresponding student association, MESA, the Middle East Studies Student Association. Um, for the program's first two years, I held leadership roles in the student association and assisted Feroz and other students in putting together last year's MACON BC, the Middle East and Islamic Consortium Student Conference, which was which was hosted by the MES minor program. Um, Yasmina. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Yasmina Seifuddin. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm currently in my third year of my undergrad at UBC. I specialize in human geography and Middle Eastern studies. Um, and outside of academia and this partnership, um, I'm particularly involved in um, student activism and um, specifically climate and social justice on and around campus. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Magdalene. I'm a fourth year international relations student with a minor in Middle East studies. And my relationship to the project is that I also was on the executive team for the Middle East Studies Students Association last year and also presented with Sophie and worked with Froze at uh, Macon this spring, which was a really great opportunity. Um, yeah, I think that's cool. Great, thanks so much. And um, so just to explain uh, the, the process, you know, we're going to each give little mini presentations here on our on our experiences and, and perspectives on our Students as Partners project, and then we're going to open it up to questions and hopefully have a discussion with you all. Slide. Um, so before we begin, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, on our behalf that we're gathered on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, and we invite you all to uh, put your own land acknowledgments into the chat if you are in different, uh, if you're in different areas. Um, slide, please. So just to start us off here, I'll, I'll give my perspective on on how it how this project began. Um, to be clear, I'd not heard of students of partners that phrase before last year. I did not know it as a distinct pedagogical approach or or ethos. And but when I when I saw the the call for this funding initiative, the students as partners in in course design grant, uh, a number of light bulbs went off for me, and I realized that I'd been doing some SAP work, albeit all, informally, and without a solid academic foundation. Uh, for quite a while, both inside the classroom and and out, and I'd created the Middle East Studies program. In fact, in collaboration with a student group here at UBC, the the Middle East Engagement Collective, and uh, in our discussions afterwards, had, had had vowed as the first chair of the program to maintain faculty student collaboration in program development and such. And I'd also been interested in um, SAP in the classroom for quite some time even though, again, I didn't know that that particular term, thinking about how to disrupt academic conventions and create more equitable dynamics in the classroom, and using these approaches to enhance student investment and engagement with the course content, and hopefully, too, to, to reorient their understanding of academia and break free from some of the constraints levied by the neoliberal university. But again, all of this had been done quite ad hoc uh, with myself as the instructor in fully or mostly in control of the process or processes. And so when I saw the call for this grant, I saw a very real opportunity to take what I was doing to another level, to learn more about students as partners, 
and explore the extent to which it could become a part of my teaching in my academic career and, and perhaps change some of my academic relationships, i.e. instructor-student relationships. And it was a chance to continue building a course that is uh, was is very dear to my heart. Um, and more than that, a chance to hopefully grow as an instructor who has, uh, at the very least in theory, tried to dedicate, uh, you know, dedicate myself to certain kinds of values and, and ideals in the academic sphere. And so before turning things over to Yasmina, I just touch on the course uh, at the heart of our SAP project. It's called MES 300, the Middle East Critical Questions and Debates. Um, and, it, and it again, you know, as I said, it, it means a lot to me, this this course. It's the core course in the in the MES program. And it being very dear to my heart, I think is, is quite significant in terms of uh, a students as partners project and, and what I'll talk about later in terms of trying to trying to let go, uh, trying to let go a little bit. I designed the course to be innovative and to be challenging for students in a, in a number of ways. It's it's replete with uh, what I believe at least are, are novel emotionality and, and critical hope interventions. And it also places a, a very large emphasis, even before this project, it placed a large emphasis on classroom community building, activism and academia, and bringing students in as partners in a joint project to reimagine Middle East studies as a field to be more equitable and, and just. And, and so again, in some ways, uh, SAP was already at the heart of the course. And I think it was impactful, uh, is was impactful for a lot of students, but uh, especially with the emotionality interventions and a uh, subtle seed fund study had conducted on emotion in the MES 300 classroom, uh, I realized that there was a lot of work to be done, and I could not, or rather, should not be uh, be doing it alone. Um, again, the course was my baby, and arguably me means more to me than any other course I've, I've ever taught. But it was clear that students needed to have a say in in its future. And in some, at the same time as I felt deep anxiety about relinquishing control. Uh, of, of my baby here and, and letting others have a say in, in how it was run, I, I felt I, I knew that an SAP approach and project were, were vital to the course, <clears throat> both to maintenance and furtherance of its ethos, as well as its efficacy in, in helping students reimagine the Middle East, Middle East studies and, and their place in, in academia. And it's been an interesting process and, and productive in, in surprising ways, I, I would say, though not without obstacles and challenges. Um, I'll speak briefly again on my observations uh, later, but uh, but now I'll, I'll turn it over to Yasmina. So yeah, I will be elaborating um, in summary how SAP as a project and its approaches were ideal for a course like uh, MIS 300. I'll specifically preface with how the SAP structure is able to house a course that challenges academic conventions as MIS 300 does. Um, in a brief and incomplete summary of the course values, MES 300 requires and depends heavily on active student discussion, course engagement, um, and an active unlearning of institutionalized academic conventions, including how Middle Eastern studies as a discipline and a field have been approached to create useful and weaponizable knowledge. So some of these um, challenged conventions include destabilizing academic objectivity um, and valuing um, emotionality and subjectivity instead, discussion-based learning and comprehending multifaceted and humanized truths, changing and rethinking how we create academic work and who we do it for, um, deconstructing the academic activist binary um, and rethinking our positionality in relation to the Middle East and even beyond that, um, and fostering a sense of critical hope for students uh, to leave the course with. So in this sense, the course is always trying to consider its students um, from empathizing with them and their experiences, to encompassing different ways to go about academia and expressing emotionality and creating a space that is both safe, but at the same time can enable students to contend with difficult questions so that hopefully they can um, have those groundbreaking, um, eye-opening epiphanies. Um, at least that's the way I see it. Um, so in order to ensure that kind of learning environment, having students as partners is crucial for bridging those gaps. Um, and the gap can mean uh, between the instructor and the students, as well as the students and the material. So in our case, us student partners all come from different, different backgrounds, have diverse experiences to share, and can offer 
intergenerational perspectives on the course and what we perhaps would have wished to see out of it when we took it since uh, Sophie and Magdalene took the first iteration of the course and I took the second and the latest one. So as students, then we can perhaps better tend to the interest of future students taking this course. Um, and in my opinion, I think what is most valuable is that we can ensure that students really do leave the course with a critical hope and maybe even a, a little bit more of a subversive understanding of the world, which I think in these times of crisis is crucial for our generation. So via the SAP format, our perspectives, ideas, and decisions are then upheld and enable us to bridge a sort of empathy gap between previous students and future students. I know that a lot of this sounds somewhat abstract and conceptual for now, so we can kind of move in uh, to using a more in-depth example from the course and the content we've been creating to see how SAP values and processes are reflected in our content creation. So at the beginning of this partnership at around May um, of this year, we were entrusted to three very lengthy spreadsheets um, full of survey results and feedback given by students in the last academic year. Uh, we combed through and evaluated each spreadsheet all in our own ways and interpretations, and then each separately produced reports recording, firstly, what we found were the most obvious trends um, that students were, um, I suppose, reporting on from what students liked, disliked, struggled with, wanted more emphasis on, et cetera. Um, and what we also did and what Rose let us take the reins on was offer up our own recommendations for how to compensate and address these trends. Um, this process, I think, very much epitomizes the student as partner format because, for one, we were trusted to make the right calls and tell the creator of this course what we thought was best and uh, what could be improved in terms of course experience. Not only does that allow us um, a sort of creative autonomy as well as the confidence to make the right decisions, but it also balances out the power dynamics between the value of the instructor perspective and the student perspective. Um, what I also believe is pretty effective um, is that we were encouraged to make suggestions based on what interested us most and what we see ourselves contributing to best. Um, I think the effects of this are twofold. We, for one, could vouch for future and past students as students ourselves who could emphasize, emphasize um, sorry, empathize better with their needs. Um, and two, um, us student partners could apply our own skill sets and our own experiences taking the course previously to then use that to boldly imagine and reimagine course material and be responsible and empowered enough to create that material ourselves. So one such trend uh, that we noticed and reported on was that um, students in the last year particularly struggled with the emotionality aspect of assignment two and navigating its difficult and somewhat unconventional criteria like um, higher purpose, which is very unfamiliar territory for I think every student who takes this um, class. Um, the second assignment, just to give a brief summary of what it's like, is in line with the second part of the course um, and is an emotive writing assignment that asks students to choose any topic of their interest that is in some way connected to the Middle East or Middle Eastern context. Um, one such example, I guess, to kind of ground this a little bit is that um, if a student is interested um, in climate justice or environmental crises, um, they might choose to look at agricultural movements and the effects of um, terra nullius discourses and Israeli states greenwashing in Palestinian contexts. Um, so the criteria for this assignment is inherently um, disruptive to conventional writing norms, um, because again, we're trying to get students to break away from the aforementioned um, academic conventions um, and can seem pretty intimidating um, to students considering some of these criteria include higher purpose, so asking students to kind of locate a vocation or a calling, uh, finding a way to express yourself emotionally, and thinking of different writing structures and even engaging with non-academic sources. So an idea I had to compensate for this um, struggle was to create a guidance document for the assignment that elaborates on the criteria while offering other guidance topics to help students achieve the criteria. Um, these other guidance topics represent concepts from the course syllabus, including uh, looking into one's own positionality, changing or rethinking your interlocutor, queering, and speaking truth to power. So um, these became guiding concepts for understanding the paper, and it was a good way to have students see themselves applying what they learned in class in this paper. So how does um, the guidance document that uh, we created and its formation represent once more the student partnership um, dynamic and SAP processes? Well, firstly, the guide itself is actually, we um, 
chose to frame it and preface it as a guide made for students by students um, and is more informal and approachable way of looking at the criteria in writing the essay. Um, it even sort of mimics and takes on the voice of a student rather than an instructor um, as to once more enable a sense of empathy. Um, it must be emphasized that this couldn't have necessarily been done without the SAP format and that we are able and allowed to translate ourselves on paper and break away from the dynamic of instructor to student, or rather student to student. Um, so making ourselves legible is already inherently changing the student experience and how they understand um, who has made their course for them. Um, secondly, as previously mentioned, SAP allows us student partners to rethink what kind of materials students may need to make the work um, accessible, um, even if atypical in its um, pedagogical approaches. And the actual creation of this content relies heavily on the basis of trust and just um, engaging in the process. Um, what I mean by this is that we were trusted to go spend weeks sometimes um, creating a draft of our ideas, like the guidance document, and allowing ourselves with not no real um, restrictions to really just transcribe our vision and our like imagination. Um, and then we would return to our weekly or sometimes bi-weekly meetings um, and come back for feedback, but not just from Faroes and trying to keep in line with the syllabus and the aim of the assignment, but between ourselves as partners. Um, and you know that usually included commenting on each other's work um, and just collectively deciding what was best. And so SAP as an environment uh, that requires student instructor collaboration and trust is able to foster the creation of this guidance document where it otherwise might not have been thought of. Um, and so what we end up having is a guide that can present and verbalize or transcribe the difficult concepts of the criteria and push students in the right direction through different prompts, questions, and propositions, and thus presenting this assignment as legible while also maintaining that it'll have to be a challenge for students. Um, so yeah, last but certainly not least, um, I do wish to clarify that SAP isn't only for a class like MES 300 that is um, inherently very, um, I think, transformative or unconventional. Rather, what MES 300 proves is that a positive feedback loop of sorts can be formed, whereby student engagement can be implemented into the course design or improved through engagement and partnership with students. Um, it helps transform how students and faculty hold relationships with each other um, and can ensure that students who take the course are maximizing what they gain from their learning. Um, so as long as student perspectives, I think, are included and there is a diverse background and set of voices and that there is a sense of trust and community that is being built between student partners um, and the professor or instructor, um, then I think real fruitful um, change can certainly affect any course that uses SAP. Um, but I will acknowledge that it does have its barriers, which I believe Sophie will be addressing next. Yes. All right. So um, considering our more critical approach to traditional academic approaches, um, both in the MES program and also uh, personally as well, we wanted to highlight some of the complexities in the SAP model that would benefit from greater recognition and discussion. So while the students as partners model is based on promoting increased student engagement, it is constructed as a partnership. Um, and what does that really look like in a university setting? And the reality of this is that there are fundamental and inherent power dynamics between faculty members and students. So whether the students and the professor that they partner with have a pre-existing academic relationship, such as Yasmina, Magdalene, and I did with Furrows or not, there is still a power dynamic that surrounds the project and will impact it. So students and faculty members bring inherently different insights, skill sets, and life experiences to the projects. And we're not suggesting that it is ideal or even really possible to try to flatten these differences and have partners contribute in similar ways. But instead, we encourage people who are engaging in this process, especially those such as faculty members who have more structural or institutional power to be cognizant of these power differentials that impact the partnership process. And this is not something that will or even really can go away with the students as partners model, but considering that there is a high value placed on student engagement and student opinion, 
uh, when in other project models, this might not be the case. It is important that faculty members who are interested in potentially undertaking a students as partners project take this really seriously and consider the possibilities for them to work with the students in new and flexible ways that break more traditional or common academic conventions and ways of doing things. So, for example, for us as students who had previously been in courses instructed by Furrows and with Magdalene and I working with him on various other projects and as part of the student association, it really still took us some time to get into a different way of working together. So where we really believed and felt that we were partners and did have ownership and agency over the project. And this initial shift in professional boundaries and working relationships is a complicated process. And Yasmina and Magdalene and I even noticed that when we started, because we were you know, very unsure of how we could contribute as partners, and we were dealing with a kind of imposter syndrome that we noticed when we would rewrite assignment instructions and guidelines, we would write in a similar way to Furrows because we just weren't confident yet in our unique voices in this aspect, and we weren't confident in you know what we were bringing to the project. There was a lot of oh, but you know we're like only students. You know how are we going to tell an instructor what he should do? Um, but you know over time and through working through this process that you know fades away and you get into you know the rhythm of doing things and. After we got out of this kind of original way of thinking and as students got more comfortable with really taking the lead on different aspects of the project, we found that this opened the doors to a lot of really great creativity. And one example of this is the, as Yasmina mentioned, the by students for students assignment guide for the emotive writing assignment. And that is one of the benefits of the students as partner model is that it does already value student engagement highly and it prioritizes this in ways that other project models don't and i think that with more groups who undertake a students as partner project more avenues for collaboration um, best practices and ways to work to mitigate these power dynamics um, will be developed and you know really engaging in beneficial partnerships can come out of this and we really want to emphasize the importance of the process in all of this because a lot of the benefits of the students as partner model are related to the process, the process of students and faculty members working together, of developing this trust together. And, um, you know, the process is so important. It's important to focus on this as well, instead of kind of just the, the final project deliverables of it all. So one way that this power dynamic can be seen structurally in the work is through the current student as partners application and approval process. In our case, and in many other cases, um, the students as partners model is currently a faculty led effort. So faculty members are primarily the ones who know about the project model and know that there is funding for such projects at UBC. And often it is the faculty member who has the original idea for the project takes the first steps in putting together the application and students are recruited to the project either after the professor has already considered the project model or after the application has already been submitted and approved. And this sets things off on an unequal footing where the students join a pre-existing project. For us, Magdalene and Yasmina and I knew about the application and we helped Furrows with editing and revisions, but we did not know anything about students as partners before or that this was even an option for students at UBC. And all three of us had been involved heavily in various kinds of on-campus student organizing and engagement, but we'd never heard of this before. So one way that we propose that these concerns can be addressed and the model can be flipped a little bit is through educating and empowering students to propose their own SAP projects. Um, and so kind of students taking, look at this, um, students taking the lead in this. So it's really important, you know, to educate and empower students to number one know about students as partners as a potential for making an impact and creating positive change for other students and the program that they are in in general and number two to know about the application process how it works you know how there is funding available for these things at UBC and be able to then you know feel confident in approaching professors with their own proposal for a students as partner project 
Um, and so as noted by Healy et al. in 2015, developing partnership learning communities among faculty and students strengthens and sustains engagement through partnership. And one of the benefits of students as partners is the student investment and sense of ownership with the course, but also in the, pro in the program as a whole. And it can really be a good avenue to channel you know, student investment and student engagement and community building in an academic setting. And additionally, as Yasmina noted earlier, one of the core values of MES is to deconstruct the academic and activist binary. One way that this can be done is for students who are already involved in on-campus organizing and activism is that they can bring their perspectives into course design instead of this staying within the class discussion. And one of the most significant trends that we saw in the results of the Subtle Seed Fund survey is that students placed a really high value on the atmosphere that was created in class through the values of MES 300 and of the program being put into practice. And while our Students as Partners project was a course design project, um, increased student engagement in Students as Partners project can move beyond course design. There are really so many possibilities for this project model. And I you know, want to note that I do think it would be incredibly difficult for even a very confident, a very bold student to approach a professor themselves and suggest that they redesign one of their courses. That is a huge thing to suggest. And so, I think that, you know, it's not just projects that kind of would look similar to what we have done, that it would be good to have, you know, students being more engaged and students kind of proposing their own ideas. There's a lot of different avenues that, you know, this can take and different um, forms that the projects will look like. So just to conclude, I think that, you know, student led students as partnered projects have the possibility to really bring out the best of the students as partners model and can open doors to new kinds of pedagogy learning and sustain student involvement in academic work and academic communities. And this is just another avenue for the students as partners model to really shine. Um, so now Magdalene. Thanks, Sophie. Um, so I will be chatting a little bit about some of the challenges that we identified with SAP work. And then after that, I'll be talking what about what our process looked like, particularly, and then just some final thoughts that I've had as we go forward with the project. So I'm going to be dividing these challenges up into two categories, logistical challenges, which I think will be more applicable to any kind of project that develops in SAP format, and then relational challenges, which will most likely depend a lot on the context of um, the project itself. So firstly, some logistical challenges. Uh, the first one I would identify would be division of labor. So redesigning, reconceptualizing a course is definitely no easy process. It's a huge amount of thought and time and work that is involved in that. And since we have four members in our team, it can often be tricky to divide the labor equally among us all in a way that uh, creates a sense of commonality in the course while still retaining our own autonomy and independence to work on different aspects of the project. So, for example, working on MES 300, a majority of our time was spent reviewing the three major projects of the course, which we've touched on a few of them and Froze mentioned uh, two of them before. So uh, rethinking these assignments means that we were all rereading lots of peer reviewed articles, looking for alternative sources, um, and that definitely takes a lot of time. So to mitigate the weight of this, we mainly assign different major aspects of each project to a different member of our team. Um, so to provide students with more in-depth uh, guidance for each of the projects, the three main projects of the course, uh, as Yasmina talked about, we wanted to create student, uh, student guidance documents for students. So by students for students. And this would include providing additional resources, adding guided questions for them, thinking points, definitions from the course, et cetera, which is how we decided to create an assignment guidance for basically all three projects. And since this takes a lot of time, we each basically spearheaded the guidance of a different project. And then 
we would come together again bi-weekly, weekly, and cumulatively provide some feedback edits. So for example, Sophie and Feroz worked very heavily on the first project of the course, which uh, focuses on Middle East studies in general and area studies, whereas Yasmina spearheaded the emotionality assignment, which was second, and I created the guidance document for the third and final critical hope assignment. And so another challenge that comes with this is if we're all working on different aspects of the course and developing our own sense of style, uh, maintaining and retaining our autonomy, you still want to create a commonality and a common voice. And so this can be a challenge. And it was actually a little bit funny because after a while of reading the entire syllabus after looking at all of the directions, all the workshops that Feroz had provided with us from the previous two years, in a way we learned the way that he phrases things and that he speaks. And I think this is really important as well. And so we were able to contribute to the course and create our own workshops and our own initiatives with MES 300 in a way that incorporates our own ideas and our own creativity, but still retains this um, this common flow, which is very beneficial for students who want to refer back to things that they've learned in the course. You still want to have a sense of familiarity. And then a third um, the challenge that of logistics that I would mention is just scheduling because we all have busy lives. We all have different jobs. We're working in different time zones because when I was uh, I was in South Africa, so 10 hours ahead at the time and they were still in Pacific time. And um, but of course, this can be mitigated as it is in most other projects. And so the more complicated, um, less um, easily uh, overcome challenges of an SAP format would definitely be relational. And as I mentioned before, this will depend a lot on the context that you're working in. So number one would be accountability and trust. And Furrows talked about this in his introduction. That's a huge, uh, it's an honor to be trusted by him with his baby, as he said. Uh, so we had to be trusted with our end of the workload every week or every two weeks. And if instructors choose to take on students as partners in this format, it's important, of course, that they they know that they will come back and have, have put in the time and the thought and, and genuine care and effort into this. And also trust that um, trust that it will contribute to this sense of commonality in the course and, and better the course itself or whatever the project might be. So we have to trust peer to peer and then instructor to peer. And then this, of course, flows into the second relational challenge, which would be navigating the student instructor professional dynamics, which Sophie touched on a lot. And this is our experience, I think, was very particular to us because we all had these pre-existing relationships with Furrows, especially uh, working with him on Macon. We had a lot of one-on-one -on -one discussions and uh, with Mesa, we knew what the vision for the course was and what the, the department uh, was striving to become at UBC. But of course, I think this 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 will depend a lot on on the project. And I would encourage instructors to to form these relationships with students early on so that if they choose to to implement an SAP format, it will flow a lot smoother and it will feel almost like a little like a little family, a little cohort, which is great. And then this will be foundational to the third challenge, which would be vulnerability. And it's only when you can be vulnerable uh, that new creative reimagined uh, opportunities arise. And that's when we can really make these uh, amazing changes in a course that integrate all of our unique perspectives and experiences. And so if I can next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so our process in particular was uh, weekly to biweekly meetings. And I would say the most impactful part of our process with this grant was that it, it, it is a year long, um, which we started in May, as Yasmina mentioned. But the length of this project really allows us to take our time and work through every nitty gritty detail from every word in the syllabus, every reading that the students are expected to read, to look at every workshop, the flow of how the course is uh, structured to make the most sense, to be the most impactful. And this allows us to really negotiate and slow down and, and talk with each other and get to know 
how we're perceiving things. And it also really allowed us to explore our own unique interests in the course. Uh, so for myself in particular, I really developed a love of learning about decolonial pedagogy. And so at the time, as I mentioned, I was, I was studying abroad at the University of Cape Town, and it's an institution that really heavily emphasizes decolonization in their teaching. And I know this is something that is is also really important to, to UBC as an institution. And so it was fascinating in studying pedagogy and decolonization within Middle East studies as a context, incorporating all these different uh, perspectives, one from post-apartheid South Africa, how this relates to the Middle East and, and being critical of area studies in general, and then also why this is relevant in UBC's context as an institution that is located on unceded indigenous land. And how can we really make diversity, equity, inclusion, and decolonization central to the way that we teach this course in general, which is um, what I think is really amazing. And I got to do this through creating a positionality workshop for students, which uh, encourages them to look at their multiple identities that impact the way that they perceive and exist within uh, Middle East studies as a researcher, the questions they pose. And I think this is part of why MES 300 is such an amazing and uh, in a way kind of innovative and revolutionary course. And so I hope that this will move forward in, in other courses as well. Um, and that this discussion will open up a new path for other departments, other faculties. And uh, yeah, I would say that it's also been hugely beneficial for all of us, I think, in, in my academic future, having worked in this structure. It's a practice in a way for working on group research projects, writing group papers, um, destabilizing academic hierarchies, which are seen as inherently uh, top down, whereas this is an opportunity for us to create a more horizontal and collaborative idea of what teaching and learning can be. And as I mentioned, I think it's also the main thing I'm drawing away from it is, is exploring these other interests and in how we can center intersectionality, decolonization, and uh, inclusion within all that we do. So yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, thanks so much. And I'm just going to I'm just going to really try and be brief here and just touch on a few things from the instruct instructor's perspective that, uh, that Sophie Maglin and, and Yasmina, uh, that Yasmina touched on. Uh, one is, is process and odds are many instructors will be like me, uh, mostly clueless about what an SAP project should look like and how it should run. And, um, you know, we did SAP workshops and such, and, and those are helpful. But when uh, I found myself in our initial team meetings, I still wasn't sure how to proceed. Um, you know, should I direct the sessions to make them more productive since, uh, you know, especially since uh, the students were feeling a bit nervous about it? Should I sit back and let students take the lead? Would they feel comfortable doing that? Am I comfortable with them uh, doing that? Um, how do we start on this work of redesigning the course, apportioning responsibilities? Um, and also, I was really concerned, too, about um, giving autonomy to students and letting them do some of this important work while not uh, making it seem and, and not actually exploiting them as as free labor um, in, a, in a course redesign project and and more lots and lots of questions and and my point here is actually that i think working out and and through the process is a major part of of sap work and, and when we started i think we all thought that we might jump right into into the work of redesigning the course and to an extent we did but that is in many ways and kind of in a little bit in hindsight now um the less important kind of work to be done, I think, my, to my mind. Um, and the more significant work is in that thinking and, and working through how we can and or, and or should be partners, despite all of the constraints and obstacles standing in our way. And, and this might mean working on the course, but at the same time, not being obsessed with product productivity in, the, in the, that kind of neoliberal sense of achieving hard, measurable outcomes all the time. Um, and, you know, definitely at the start of the course, and then sometimes even in the middle of the project, we needed to step back from those measurable outcomes or even give up on, on some of them to reassess, rethink, reflect on, on how and, and what we were, what we were doing. And I think, you know, when approached in this way and without that kind of obsession 
on those on those measurable outcomes, um, SAP can be a call to undertake that slow, thoughtful, meaningful, and, and transformative kind of uh, scholarship and, and work. And so, obviously, we need to set goals for our, our projects. But my, you know, one of the things that I take from it, at least for me, is that we shouldn't let those goals, you know, constrain us as a team or hold us back from that more important important work, which is again learning how to work in partnership with each other and and letting this process transform academic work, academic life, and and these and these relationships, and let the let the work unsettle those uh, and let unsettle those a little bit. And those are not very tangible outcomes, which is uh, not what a lot of us are, are used to. Quickly, I'd just touch as well on, on authority and power differentials, although I think it's been said, you know, we, we can't do away with them completely, uh, nor should we pretend that they don't exist. Uh, they do. And, you know, for my part, at least I tried in as much as possible to uh, acknowledge that with the students to lay it out there at the same time as we're, we're trying to work against them a little bit. Um, and that meant for myself, at least, relaying some of my anxieties uh, about it and and uh, you know being vulnerable uh, in, in that sense and asking them how we can move forward and what would work best uh, for them and of course it's letting go uh, that that's the hard part um, you know I said this course was was my baby now our baby uh, it, it was anxiety provoking to let people uh, to let students in uh, into that course design process with with this course in particular and it helped that I knew and I trusted these students. I've taught them all and, and know and know their work ethic and, and such. Um, that's not a call necessarily to recruit students that you know or to recruit, you know, kind of top tier students for every for every uh, course and, and project. I think there's there's good reasons to take a very different approach uh, there, but it helped me with this course and, and this project. Um, and and you know this is part of the process as well it's kind of a balancing act when do i intervene to say you know from my experience that something won't work or that would complicate things and when do i sit back and let the students uh, run with something and, and take the lead on something that's that's part of the process and i think you know to my mind again if we are grappling with those questions then we're doing some important sap work right there um, and finally just quickly i want to talk about the future uh, namely what to do once a project runs its course, uh, once the funding runs out. Um, and I, I think, you know, if you're doing this as an instructor primarily for the funding or to say you got a grant or simply to get some work done on the course, then that's going to impact the kind of project you undertake. I'm not saying those aren't important. They are they are important for, for all of us, but it, it will impact that if that's your primary uh, impact the project and the course, if that's your primary motivation. Um, if, however, you know, we can undertake SAP projects to understand what that as an approach can, can itself offer, how it might transform us as instructors, transform our students and academic works, then the project itself is only really a, a beginning. And it becomes incumbent on the team to reflect on how they can keep doing SAP work. And so, you know, what things that I've discussed with with the students is giving credit to them for their work in the syllabus and, and discussing the SAP project with the future MES 300 students and them coming into the classroom as well to, to continue some of this uh, work with them. And we also need to keep thinking on, on how, reflecting on how SAP has potentially changed us individually and as a team and what it means in the classroom and for academic work more generally. And in part, this workshop is for you, for you and to you know engage in a discussion with you all, but it's also for us uh, a beginning to that process of reflection and exploration of where we can go from here. And so we're hoping to continue these kinds of reflections and explorations and presentations, workshops, publications and such into the new year and perhaps uh, even beyond the, the time frame of the project. Um, so with that, I, I just want to stop and, and thank you all uh, for being here and we'll open it up for questions, which you're free to put your Zoom hands up uh, or to put them into the chat. Hello. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for this talk. It was really, really insightful. And um, my question, I guess, is how would you propose? Um, I think that in certain faculties, it's kind of like less likely for instructors to adopt this approach. Um, and yeah, I'm just wondering if you have any kind of advice on how to um, like further like popularize this type of uh, like engagement with students, um, especially maybe in faculties that are uh, 
impulsively more kind of like conservative when it comes to to you know these types of relationships with students um and yeah i would love both you know of course your perspective as an instructor as well as maybe some of the students perspectives on this um but yeah thank you so much thanks for that. maybe i'll turn it over to the students first Um, I guess I can go first. And I mean, we we talked about this a little bit in terms of, you know, the broader scope of Students as Partners projects and how that can look at UBC and also outside of UBC. And I think it is I think it is hard because, um, you know, we all have like Yasmina and Magdalene and I um, and also for us have, you know, a background in the humanities and are very involved in kind of that aspect of you know UBC and also academia and you know we know that I mean even you know there are kind of more conservative uh faculties in humanities but you know we did consider like how you know what kind of would this look like with you know a stem kind of related project and i believe you know there are in kind of this year's students as partners cohort there are some uh faculty members and students who are working from like a science stem background um and i'm sure they would you know know more but that was something that we did kind of think about in terms of also you know we all kind of inhabit a very specific kind of academic tradition if that makes sense and so things that you know we were discussing or um looking at it can be kind of i think like you get kind of lost in what you're surrounded with and don't really kind of stop thinking about how there are lots of other kinds of like academic conventions and ways of doing things um and how you know, certain like propositions and models um, might be like more kind of not foreign, but like I think people might have less of a background to understand them through from other backgrounds. Um, but I think that, you know, students could be like a really good um, kind of way to do that. And because it's, you know, if there's a lot of faculty members in other areas who, you know, growing up in their academic traditions and, you know, with their background um, in academia might kind of not really see necessarily the value of it or might not really kind of find the model appealing. Um, I think then that could also be a way for kind of like the new generation or like younger students or um, a you know, faculty members and professors who are earlier on in their career and maybe more open to it to introduce it kind of like from like a bottom up way. Um, at least that's kind of my perspective on that. But um, I think like, you know, I really know mostly about kind of this sphere that I work in, so. Um, I think I can add, I think that one way that uh, instructors from other faculties might be able to incorporate pieces of an SAP format would be what we did at the beginning of our project, which was collecting uh, a lot of data about how students felt about the course, uh, maybe what was lacking. I think if instructors decided to do more re uh, check-ins and get to know their students on more of a personal level, I can't speak for all professors, of course, in other faculties, but my 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 peers who are a part of other faculties, um, maybe more STEM related, or you know, for example, I think they they often feel they lack a an instructor student relationship uh, and get to know them very closely. And so I think instructors could really make it make a concerted effort to rather than just have the SSC reviews uh, at the end of the term, you know, hand out in class potentially a more detailed um, form that would be genuinely open to to changes in the course or what they would like to see or how they felt throughout the course. Yasmina, did you wanna say anything about it? Um, no, I mean, Sophie and Magdalene put it both so eloquently, but I think it just echoing Magdalene's point, it speaks largely more so to um, like those SCEI surveys at the end of the year, like how are we engaging with students and how can we be more critical and just perhaps 
diversifying and even compartmentalizing this SAP format so it's just more accessible and it comes from the students rather than the instructor. But it does, yeah, it does speak more so to changing, um, I think, more than just the students feeling confident enough to go up to a professor, but a professor feeling comfortable enough to, um, as Froze put it, let go um, and have that kind of uh, student to instructor mentor relationship. Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, we uh, it, it is hard, as we said, to to approach an instructor and say, hey, I want to redesign your course. Um, but I, I think there's potentially a way to do it. I wouldn't necessarily you know, myself uh, do it with with any instructor. But, you know, if you if you've taken courses with an instructor and you and you know them, you know them a little bit, I think. Um, it would be perhaps acceptable. You'll have to judge for yourself, perhaps acceptable to go, you know, uh, up to you know, have a meeting with them and say, I love this course that I, I took with you, flatter them, uh, get their egos up a little bit before uh, <laughs> before it all, you uh, you introduce it and and say, you know, have, do you know about this? Do you know about this grant? You know, would you ever consider about, um, I'm really interested in course design or, you know, I want to pursue an academic career and think this would be great. Have you ever considered this and, and bring it up to them that way? I also think, you know, this, this, this funding opportunity um, is, is quite new at UBC. And and so uh, th this is also about just educating the wider UBC community that there's this thing called students as partners. As I said, I didn't know about this a year, until about a year ago. So it's about letting letting instructors and students know that there is this uh, this pedagogical approach out there and starting to get them to think about it. Some instructors I don't think will be interested in it, but I think a lot of I think a lot of instructors uh, would be interested in in theory or putting it in into practice uh, into putting it into practice like this. Uh, Rosalind, did you want to weigh in on this or is there a question? Yeah, I do have a question. Yeah. And then I have a couple of things I was hoping to say, but there's other questions. So I want to allow time for others. Um, I was really so thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I really music to my ears. It was a lovely, um, lovely session to attend for, on so many levels. Um, I wanted to hear your thoughts on how we, the initiative, as um, one of the three people responsible for the, this initiative in my role at CTLT, can raise awareness better with students, right? There are thousands of students at UBC, and you raised a really apt point that, you know, we don't, we don't, as students, we don't always hear about the plethora of opportunities, this being one of those opportunities. How do we help students learn more about it? How do we how do we get through the many, many channels and clubs and initiatives to, to let people know? Because I would love to see um, more, more students applying and taking the lead. So what are those venues? Because I am not an undergraduate student and I'm removed from that world. So what are some of those spaces and places? I'm not a student, so I don't know if I, <laughs> I don't necessarily want to want to weigh in on it. I and mean, you can get back to me. It, and it's yeah. a call for everybody. Like this is a communal UPC initiative. It's it's open to faculty and students to submit proposals. How do we better get students informed of it? Right. So you can you can totally let me know your thoughts later. It doesn't have to be now. And others, if you have idea who are who are in the room, I'd love to hear. Um, and I also wanted to offer a couple of things to think about maybe moving forward. Just um, there's the International Journal for Students as Partners. And perhaps you might think about submitting something there based on your work together. Um, that would be a, a lovely space. And um, I have a few other resources I might suggest looking at around power and uh, how, how power is conceptualized and um, taken up across these kinds of initiatives. So I'll follow up with you all later. And just a plug for those that might be interested in submitting to the students as partners course design grants, our next call for proposals from students and or faculty um, or some combination thereof uh, is due February 23rd. And I'll put the website in the chat in case you're interested. Spread the word, please. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, I see a, a qu few questions in, in the chat there. Uh, one what does UBC require in terms of outcome assessment of the SAP project? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think you know we we will have to submit as as you usually do with with these kind of grant projects a, a report at the end. Um, perhaps on on outcome assessment though, I would just say I think 
it's okay if your outcomes change during the project and and that's going to be the case that's go it's going to be the case for us you know i think when we uh when we put in the application we had three major initiatives we wanted we wanted to undertake and we haven't really done the third one and we're not going to get to it i mean again this speaks to what what was said before by a few of us of, of slowing of slowing down we we the work took a lot longer than we thought it was going to at times in in part because we felt it necessary to to pump the brakes uh, to pump the brakes a little bit there so you know the outcomes uh, the outcomes can uh, can change um and then in terms of reporting those those less tangible outcomes I, I don't know I'm not I'm not sure I think that's more for maybe some of the journals and and such that uh, that Rosalind uh, uh that Rosalind brought brought up there um, but you know, again, for for us, that has been, or at least I'll say for myself, that's been that's been in some way, in many ways, more impactful than those those tangible outcomes to to the course and, and its its learning outcomes and and, and such. Um, did you require permission from leadership or others before sharing previous student surveys with SAP students for analysis? Uh, we did consult. We did consult with the with the SAP team and uh, as well with the SOTL, uh with the SOTL people. All of it was anonymous, so uh, it was uh, we were we were given permission to to do it. Um, I'm not sure if we needed permission, but I think it's always uh, you might want to want to ask that you know, just uh, just in case, um, just in case. How would you remunerate uh, the students on the application proposal ready process? That's a good question. Um, they weren't. <laughs> they weren't. Uh, you know, I, I have to, as as was brought up before. I I heard about this funding, uh, this 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 grant. Uh, I wrote. I took the the initiative to write the the grant uh, application and then sent and then sent it on. Uh, then sent it on uh, to. Uh, to uh, to uh, the students, so uh, you know, I I on that regard, I took on the bulk of work, uh, which has its pros and and its cons. As I as was said, it'd be nicer, better, I think, if the students are led into the process much earlier and and help to write it. But on the other hand, as you're pointing out, um, they would not be uh, they would not be paid for that, and I'm not sure if the grant would allow you to um use the funds that you will eventually that you hopefully will eventually get uh to pay them to pay them for that but of course there's the chance that you might not get the grant um in which case that would be that would be moot so it's it's a really good it's a really good question um and one of the things that with these the this application for this grant it is uh requested and it and you know it's part of the criteria that students be involved with the application um, so on remuneration, this is this is a good this is a good point, but they may not be they may not be remunerated for it. Um, in our case, these are three highly motivated uh, students who were excited about the project and and were excited about the course as well. So um, they wanted to be involved, but uh, that might be different for for different courses and, and instructors. Um, what are some of the implications you see for disciplines like psychology? For instance, at UBC, it's quite hard to, to create ethical collaboration between undergrads and faculty due to the rigorous selection process, where consistent involvement with their research preludes the involvement in collaboration. Do you have any ideas for navigating such power dynamics? Maybe I'll turn it over to the students first, since I've been answering the last few questions have been for the instructor. Any thoughts? Okay, I, I don't think that for us, the power dynamics were ever a huge issue. I think it's because Froze always treated us with a, a great amount of respect and um, it never felt, I think from our end as students, we might have had a bit of imposter syndrome sometimes because wondering what our role in the project would be and what we could contribute at the beginning. And we kind of uh, figured that out over time. But overcoming that, I think it's just knowing that that this instructor trusts you enough to be a part of this project and and just talking with each other on equal grounds and and taking the time to meet each other and and it just is it, we just always talk very respectfully and I think weigh a lot we value each other's opinions regardless of who they come from yeah and uh, you know i might i might add that 
this this can be hard as an instructor, and I can I can only imagine it'll be more difficult in in certain disciplines uh, due to yeah as you as you say certain ethical uh, obligations and and rules and and such. Um, just be upfront with the students. I would say you know if there if there are limitations to the things that you can do or that you personally say on like an ethical level um, are are willing to engage. I think that should be. A, a topic of discussion with your students, and and you know part of this is, uh, you know, with with these kind of SAP projects is is kind of you know, uh, uh, you know, pulling the curtains back a little bit on on what we do as uh, as academics and, and as as instructors, and so just talk talk these things through with them and um, get their get their feedback uh, get their feedback on it is is what I would say. Uh, that yeah, I'm, I'm I'm hesitant to give any more uh, advice in, in in that regard because of course the you know psychology is is not is not my discipline. But I think you you can you do what you you do what you can, and the that what you feel you can't do in a, a kind of project like this, you open up to the students about this and 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 help them to understand it and get their get their responses to it because you know there as as was the case many times in our project, there were things that I just had not thought about because I'm I've been looking at it with my narrow in, instructor instructor lens and so um, you know students uh, as, as all, many of us know uh, students can can surprise you and, and and help you to think about your work in in a different way so be open tell them what your concerns and anxieties are um, what you're willing to do what you're not willing to do and and then open it up to a conversation uh, open it up to a conversation with them is is what I would say. We, we're out of time, but I'm, I'm, you know, I think we're happy to stick around for a few moments if, if anyone else has any has any questions. If not, I, I just want to I just want to thank you all for for coming to uh, coming to our, our workshop and, and for engaging with us. Um, and uh, of course, if if any of you have questions on SAP, uh, obviously get get in touch with Rosalind. Um, but uh, if you have questions more about you know how these projects go and and the challenges of them, uh, I, th I think all of us uh, are, are happy to happy to talk more about our experiences with it. Um, so so thanks once again for for coming. <laughs>